Happy National Day, Singapore! The National Museum's docents have come together to prepare this special presentation. What can our artifacts tell us about Singapore as a country? Its people and key moments in history. Keep watching to learn interesting stories and insights on five artifacts that we've specially chosen for you. And stay tuned for a closer look at these artifacts, all from the comfort of your own home. I'm Lily and I'm Carrie, and we'll tell you more about the Padang which is featured in a painting by J.T. Thompson. You know Carrie, this 1851 painting by J.T. Thompson is really a very special one. It's called the Padang, which in Malay actually means feel. But even then, it's a very iconic space for us Singaporeans of the 21st century. The reason is in 1966, it was the venue of our very first National Day Parade which was just one year after we truly became independent on our own. Now, as you know, the Padang is still one of the two main venues for the National Day Parade today. Certainly involving a lot more people than the strollers that we see here. Yes, and there are quite a few people strolling around in this picture, aren't there, Millie? We've got a group of Arabs, a man wearing a turban, and there is a lady in a full body veil. Moving further across, this is a Chinese family. And we can tell they've got these long ponytails that were known as cues. Right in the foreground here, this is a group of indigenous Malays uh, in a family grouping there. And then further across in the painting, we have a group of Indians. Some are sitting cross-legged, uh, others with loincloths and they surround an Indian sepoy soldier, so a soldier for the British. And Millie, did you know that the Indians were the first main builders here in Singapore? They built the first principal buildings and roads. Yes, many of the Indians were brought over as Indian convict labour by the British. Where would Singapore be without this early group of workforce? Many of the old buildings, such as the St Andrews Church that you see here, was built by them. And if we look at the large houses around the Padang, as you know, Carrie, they're all gone. They were later replaced by public buildings such as the City Hall and the Supreme Court, which of course today house the National Gallery, home of Southeast Asian and Singapore art. And Millie, I bet J.T. Thompson, the artist of this picture, would have loved to have featured himself in that gallery. And did you know, he actually might have painted himself in this picture here, along with other Europeans that you can see riding in carriages or on horseback. And it really shows a mix of the race and cultures that was in early Singapore. Yes, and even today, Singapore reflects this very multicultural mix. But I do wonder sometimes, Carrie, what would Thompson paint if he were to do the painting again today? You know, who would he cover? What would he paint? I'm sure he'll have to cover a lot more ethnicities uh, to make sure that everyone's represented. My name is Genevieve and I will take you to the Modern Colony Gallery where we will explore the story of the Matias or the Amas. Welcome to the Modern Colony Gallery. Now this is what your house might have looked like in 1920s and 1930s Singapore. That is, if you could afford it. But we are not here today to talk about the grandeur of this house or the opulent lifestyles of its occupants, but about a hidden group of women who are largely in the kitchens, in the back rooms, away from everyone else. These were the Amas, or the Martyrs. Martyrs came to Singapore in the 1930s as a result of the collapse of the silk industry in China, in the Pearl River Delta area. Most martyrs in Singapore worked as domestic servants and they were known to be loyal, hardworking and extremely stern. But what I've always found very inspiring about the martyrs is their sense of independence and sense of self. In an era where women were expected to be married in order to be respectable in society, these martyrs banded together with other martyrs, earned their own keep, swore vows of celibacy and in essence declared that they need not be defined by marriage. 
In the gallery, we have some paraphernalia associated with sohe or the combing up ceremony. So the sohe would be a very big event in the Matya's life, almost akin to a wedding. We have here a basin with the double happiness or Shuangxi symbol and we have here an almanac from which an auspicious date would be chosen for the sohe. Red packets will also be given out and it would be a very joyous occasion. During the actual ceremony, an older Matya would comb up the hair of the younger Matya who was taking her vows in front of a statue of the Goddess of Mercy. From that point onwards, the Matya was considered part of the sisterhood, she was independent she could earn her own keep and she need not rely on any man for money or identity. I'm inside the surviving Shonan Gallery at the National Museum of Singapore. These exhibits and stories provide an understanding of what life was like in Singapore during the Japanese occupation from February 1942 till September 1945. Being subjected to great adversity and scarcity, the local people rose above hardships and adapted to difficult living conditions. Many demonstrated extraordinary courage, strength, resilience, clung on to hope and carried on with life. Some lucky ones even found love. These golden rings bear the names of their owners, Lam Yok Ying and Lai Kok Wa. Although they were already neighbours, Fate brought them closer together inside a makeshift bomb shelter during an air raid. They spoke for the first time as bombs rained above and sparks flew between them. Against conventional practice, it was Yok Ying who proposed after only a few months of dating. They survived the perils of war, started a family and shared their bittersweet memories in a video interview in April 2015 when Kokwa was 99 and his beloved wife 94. However, the writer who penned this diary did not get an opportunity to enjoy a long marriage like theirs. He was Major General Lim Bo Singh, a leading member of Force 136 who participated in anti-Japanese activities in Malaya and Singapore. Reluctantly, he left his wife and seven children on the 11th of February 1942 and travelled from Singapore to Sumatra, going onwards to Calcutta. His desire to communicate with his wife led him to begin writing this diary until its last entry on 4th of April 1942. His entries include moving messages to his wife as well as worry for his children and how he missed them. While in India, Limbo Singh recruited and trained agents for Force 136 and returned to Malaya in 1943 to continue the fight against the Japanese. In 1944, he was captured and died in Batu Gaja prison at the age of 35. He is remembered for his fortitude and heroism. In his diary, his words exude an outpouring of love for his family and would tug at your heartstrings. Love and loss are often inextricably linked, as experienced by Madam Sim Su Wee, who has also shared her wartime memories. Madam Sim's father perished during the Sukching operation. 18th of February 1942 was the last day that she saw her father alive. On that day, he was taken away by Japanese soldiers from home and never returned. Madam Sim believed that he was shot during the Sukching massacre. Her family never found out where he was killed. Her mother was grief-stricken and already suffering from tuberculosis died 10 months later. Madam Sim and her siblings were taken in by their aunt. She described her aunt as someone who is noble and selfless. She would give up her portion of rice to the children and ate the leftovers. Relatives reached out to the community and raised funds for the children. These acts of kindness convey a message of hope. Amid the darkest days in Singapore's history, true love, hope, and kindness prevailed. 
come visit us at the Xionan Gallery and experience these stories yourselves. Hello, I'm Lily. I'll share memories of Singapore's local products such as Cetron TV and Roline cameras from the early years of Singapore's industrialization. We are now in the Building and Economy section of the Singapore History Gallery. This section covers Singapore's rapid economic development and industrialization during the 1960s and the 1970s. Growing up in the 1960s, Cetron, a very renowned uh, local brand that produced uh, radios and televisions just like this one here, reminds me of my school days where I would go to my neighbor's house to watch the black and white Hindi movies as well as the Chinese classical movies and the uh, local variety shows. Well, those days, transmission breakdowns were common and uh, well, only in 1963, 15th February, Channel 5 was launched by the television Singapura. It was rather expensive to own a black and white TV as my dad's wages were low and it was not considered a necessity. On 7th July 1974, Channel 5 launched its first live colour telecast. The following month, the 9th National Day Parade held at the Padang was also telecasted in uh, colour and in four languages for the first time. I joined EDB in 1973. I oversee the financial administration of EDB office in Singapore and overseas, as well as the training institutions. RGTC was set up in 1973 to run precision optics, tool making and precision machining courses. Rolai was a world-renowned producer of cameras, fresh guns, projectors, lenses, and shutters. I still own the Rolai mini camera, which is the Rolai 35 LED. Over here on display, we have a Rolai XF35. Rolai trained thousands of Singaporeans in precision engineering skills, laying the foundation for the rise of the electronics industry, which remain a mainstay in Singapore's manufacturing sector today. I am Chai and I will be showing you around a recreated HDB flat in the Singapore History Gallery while sharing stories about time savers and Singapore in the 1960s. I am standing at the Building a Home section in the Singapore History Gallery of the museum and I will be showing you around a recreated HDB flat while sharing with you stories on time savers and life in the early decades of the Republic. This is a recreation of an HDB kitchen inspired by a photograph published in HDB's Our Homes magazine in 1977. The Housing and Development Board, or HDB, was established in February 1960. At the time, Singapore had a population of about 1.6 million people, the majority of whom had poor living conditions. In the first three years of HDB's existence, more than 21,000 flats were built to address the acute housing shortages. Can you imagine the reaction of families as they move into their very first HDB home? Can you imagine the excitement and sense of wonder as they step into their very first flat, complete with electricity, pipe waters and modern sanitation? This was a far cry from their previous experiences living in overcrowded conditions without modern sanitations and having to share toilets and a tiny kitchen with several other families. From the 1960s, with an improved economy, many families were beginning to be able to afford time-saving home appliances such as this electric rice cooker. Rice is a staple for many Asian families. Those who have cooked rice the traditional way, that is, in a pot over the stove, will remember the effort to cook a pot of warm, fluffy rice. a and was the first to open an outlet in September 1968. It was located at the Malaysia Singapore Airlines building on Robinson Road. They also subsequently opened the first drive-in restaurants 
on Bukit Timah Road. It was there that I had my first taste of American fast food, such as the hamburgers and french fries. A&W was also famous for their root beer. I particularly loved the root beer with its topping of vanilla ice cream. And can you believe it? A glass of root beer cost only 40 cents at the time. Buying takeaway from fast food restaurants was popular, especially if it came with souvenirs. These drinking glasses featuring the A&W bear mascot came with takeaway packs in the 1980s. Many families would treasure these, especially if they have young children. As you can see, the items found in the HDB homes reflect the improved lives of the average Singaporean. Today, more than 80% of Singaporeans live in HDB flats, with 90% of them owning their own homes. And gracious living is not simply confined to the home. Today, Singaporeans can step out of their HDB flat into a beautiful green environment. But that will be the subject of another story in another section of the museum. Thank you. We hope you enjoy this tour. We look forward to meeting you in the museum in the future. And we'd love to hear from you on our tours.